So I think we'll, we'll go ahead and get started. It looks like our, our number of people joining is stabilized a bit. I wanna welcome everybody here to the session today. Uh, my name is Suzanne Thornsbury. I'm a senior advisor in the Office of the Chief Scientist at USDA, um, an advisor in ag economics and rural communities, and just thrilled to see such a great turnout for this symposium. We've been very excited to put it together, and I think uh, many thanks to Dan and, and Tyler for bringing us all together today. So just a couple of reminders for the usual reminders at the beginning of, of these virtual sessions that we have. Um, and I think everybody's already on this, but please mute if you're not speaking, just in interest of helping everybody else here. And a reminder that this session is being recorded. I think everybody got that note when they signed on, but <clears throat> just wanna let you know. So I think um, just to get us started, um, I'm gonna give just a very, very, very brief background. I feel a little like I'm preaching to the choir because I'm sure the, the folks that are on the call know all this, but it's a good way to, to uh, launch us. And then we're gonna come back and, and do a really brief um, little um, online Zoom poll to see what uh, folks' interests are. And then we're going to turn to our panelists, which of course is uh, where we really want to get to today. We want to hear from our panelists and then lots of discussion at the end. This certainly is a fast moving area. And so I'm sure there are many, many things that uh, are, we're all going to learn today. Absolutely. So just a little few reminders, um, again, to, to help us get started. Um, I think Partially the reflection of why we have a great turnout for this is the interest in him and the interest in um, a crop and a production area and an industry that was reintroduced to the US in through the 2014 Farm Bill. Um, and for us as ag economists and, and other folks as well, it really is sort of a, an interesting time to see this commodity and this industry and all the associated pieces sort of grow from, from scratch and develop and how this has gone forward. So under the 2014 Farm Bill, you all know, I'm sure um, that states were able to launch pilot programs as long as the states themselves had passed legislation um, allowing for the, the hemp cultivation. And so we saw a lot of activity um, developing there as, as states sort of got started at various um, times and places and rolled out programs in different ways. <clears throat> and um, then we got to 2018 and that the 2018 Farm Bill descheduled hemp as a controlled substance and so really sort of opened the door for commercial production, not just among states but also among tribal nations. So it extended the, the reach or the availability of this um, market of, of, of this new commodity to others who hadn't had the opportunity in the past. The other thing the 2018 Farm Bill did was it um, sort of um, tasked USDA with developing regulations uh, for production programs and established the basis for USDA to develop a licensing program and approval program for uh, various state and tribal nation production plans. And we're gonna hear more about that today. So, um, you know, we'll, we'll hear more about the details of how that unfolded, um, I'm guessing, from one of our presenters based on the title. Um, so in October, 2019, USDA published their interim final rule that would regulate how hemp could be produced in the US. And as you can imagine, there were a lot of comments and a lot of feedback. And I'm sure people on this call provided a lot of that input, uh, which was very, very welcomed. And in January of this year, the final rule was released from USDA, which um, had significantly more flexibility in some of its provisions. 
But still, you all know right now at this time, the authority for hemp production under the 2014 Farm Bill still exists, and there's states that have opted to stay under that program for now, as well as authority under the 2018 Farm Bill, and there's states and tribal nations that have opted to operate under there. So we sort of have this mixed um, bag that's going on in the, the regulatory arena. And as these plans uh, continue to evolve and develop, and you know, so just this week, right, uh, USDA approved the, the Colorado hemp production plan. I know we're gonna hear more about that one. But as economists then, this really gives us sort of a rare opportunity, you know, to talk about the, the birth, if you will, of a market, of an industry, it, you know, we always talk about these things um, sort of in a theoretical way. We talk about infant industries, we talk about market development, we talk about all of these things. And now we're, we're witnessing this in, in real time, we're a part of it. And so in many respects, that's sort of the best of times for us, but it's also the worst of times because things are moving fast and they're, very, and they're moving in you know, pieces are moving in fits and starts and going forward. Um, we very, very rapid shifts in supply and demand. And we all know what that means, right? Very, very rapid price fluctuations, um, often hard to uh, project what might happen in the market coming next. Uh, we all know this is a, is a product, is a process product. And so that means that this whole supply chain is under development at the same time. And so we've seen lots of activity in the area of um, research about various uses, uh, new products, new uses for hemp, what could or uh, could be done and, and how does that evolve? And what is it that consumers are asking for? And we're gonna hear more about that from, from one of our panelists later on. So. All of these things are sort of developing in, in real time. I talked about the regulatory environment a little bit al already. Obviously I came at that through a USDA lens, but we're certainly not the only department that's in, involved. And, and we know that um, the DEA and EPA and others certainly still have a big role to play in this FDA, obviously. Um, and so this regulatory environment crosses many, many boundaries, not just between the federal and the state and at times the local jurisdictions, but also across departments and agencies within the federal government um, and even back to, to Congress, to the original legislation, um, thinking about sort of what that threshold value would be uh, for total THC content that would move things from a the hemp arena into the, the marijuana arena, arena <laughs> and, and how that might be divided. But if you think about it, um, again, from a, a grower or supply chain perspective, um, or from a research perspective, whereas where a lot of us sit, all of these systems are under development. The breeding, the genetics, None of that was ready to go. There's a lot of unknowns there about how particular strains might manifest themselves, various characteristics. What are the best agronomic practices? Um, a lot of these things that, you know, we tend to um, take for granted, if you will, in more established commodities and more established markets, they're all undergoing research and testing right now, pest and disease, um, what are quality attributes? You know, how do we measure those? How do we signal those to our buyers, to our consumers? And to top it all off, if that wasn't enough uncertainty, a lot of the folks that have gotten into this particular commodity in these markets are new uh, to agriculture sometimes altogether. Everybody's new to the commodity, right? A lot of them are small and mid-sized farmers. They may not access information in the same ways that some of us were, were used to providing information. So we've had to really think about how do we reach the folks that are asking us uh, for information, for input? That has created enormous challenges. You know, I think Dan reminded me of this yesterday. What does all that uncertainty mean in the financial markets? 
You know, if there's one thing that a banker hates, it's uncertainty, right? And so, um, you know, there, there's been a lot of sort of fits and starts about access to, to financing and certainly just access to basic data, you know, and as, as ag economists, we're always excited, I think, about data. And here we are in a situation where there's very, very little, um, particularly on a, a sort of a long or a time series um, way, it just doesn't exist. And so how do we provide information to people? So these are the challenges I think that we faced in our profession, that we faced as, as a whole, as, as researchers, as scientists, as regulators, as educators, people who are trying to help um, the folks in this industry and to, to help provide the knowledge information that's going along. So I've, I've seen this described in various ways. Um, depending on people's perspectives. Sometimes it's the wild, wild west, and sometimes it's the golden opportunity. I think it's probably both of those, um, but it, it has certainly created some, some challenges and some exciting times for us all. I would say we're extremely lucky today to have four panelists who took on this challenge um, early on, you know, who've tried, who've gotten out of the gate early, providing some data, some information, some insight about the ways that this industry is evolving, about ways to think about things. So we're super excited to hear from them. Before we do that, I do want to give everybody in the audience a chance to um, participate a little bit in a poll. And I'm going to ask Rebecca, I know she's going to run this poll for us. We have a few questions just at the beginning to sort of elicit information about who's out there and in, in our audience and what the interests are. So if you wouldn't mind, just real quick, um, it won't take you much time, answer this poll and um, we'll get a good feel for the results. And I think Rebecca will probably share those with us. It should be open. It is. Can other folks see it as well? I see responses coming in, so. I can, I can see it, Suzanne. Great, thank you. So Rebecca, you'll have to give us sort of a thumbs up when it's when it looks like you've got uh, looks like we've got 81 on the call. So when it looks like you've got a significant number of answers, yep. or when that slowed down, we have 83% participation. So I'll give it just another second and close it out. Perfect. So everybody should be able to see the results. This is great. So we all intend to work, or a majority of us intend to work on hemp in the next few years. Fairly evenly distributed, although policy and regulation seems to be a, a target. Pretty even among the uses. And there's a lot of us from the government in this workshop. So I think what we'll 
do next is um, we're going to turn this over to our panelists and start the sort of the bulk of the, the meeting here. We really do want this to become very interactive. So we're going to um, go to the panelists. They'll each have probably around 15 minutes for their presentation. Each one of you guys can share your screen as, as you choose. Um, and then We'll have a few minutes after each presentation for questions for that particular panelist, mostly clarifying, and then that should give us plenty of discussion time um, at the end. So I will just do a very, very brief introduction uh, for the panelists, and then I'll let them tell you themselves what, they, what they'd like for you to know. But our first person up is um, Jane Kulininski from University of Vermont. And I talked about all the moving pieces in the hemp market. When I tell you all of Jane's titles, you'll understand why she's so very, very good at all of this. So she is a professor, as I mentioned, at University of Vermont. She's the chair of Community Development and Applied, e Applied Economics Department, and also wears the hat director of the Center for Rural Studies. So Jane, are you ready to take it away? I am Suzanne, thank you. And I'll put my timer on. Um, before I share my screen, Dan gave us several questions to answer. And so I'll start there and then probably have to motor through the presentation that I thought I was, I was going to give. So the first question that I'll answer is what applied hemp research project or projects are you working on? So um, right now, I've got uh, five different product projects of which I am uh, project director on four and co-PI on one. One very interesting one is a research and extension experiences for undergraduates. We had 14 undergraduate students at UVM this summer from places as far as Stillman College, Prairie View, Tuskegee, University of Massachusetts and Kenyon College, looking at the agricultural transition and using design thinking systems using hemp as as the topic area. And so they were engaged in research all the way through data collection and communication from uh, things from genetics, uh, pest scouting, consumer, consumer economics, um, demand, all the way through communication. Another one is a USDA foundational grant of which um, Rebecca's also part of, and so is uh, Tyler, Mark, who are also here today. And um, that one is really to look at the economic impact of hemp, um, build the social accounting matrices and actually come up with the multipliers for a variety of, of hemp uh, products. That group is also um, going to launch a national consumer survey very soon. And we have a group of graduate students who are working on um, a qualitative content analysis of all of the plans, the state plans and tribal plans. And um, you can stay tuned for that one. The article is, is almost ready to submit and it's quite interesting of uh, their content analysis of that. Also have a, a grant from the Gund Institute for the Environment at, at UVM to look at anticipated demand using discrete uh, choice experiments and IRI data to look at actual consumer purchases and Tyler's on that one too. Um, I have a USDA Ag Experiment Station Hatch project to look at new novel crops. Um, saffron and hemp is the other one. And we just finished up uh, our AMS Food System Center grant. We're one of the first new centers in 20 years for AMS. Um, developing, one of the projects was developing uh, metrics for food systems and our project was chosen for hemp and we're looking at environmental met metrics, community social metrics and um, economic metrics. So that answers that question. Uh, what private and public stakeholders have been involved? Well, as you know, large U, uh, USDA projects must, must have advisory groups and stakeholder groups. So anywhere from um, the commercial sector, which is a track and trace um, group, uh, production producers, marketers, manufacturers, uh, to policymakers at the local and national level. And of course, all of our projects uh, relate to policy issues in some way. What impacts has your project had? Well, I think that we're beginning to ferret out um, some of, and this is what I'll talk about today in my presentation, um, we're trying to ferret out what really are the characteristics of a variety of products. You know, CBD is just the tip of the iceberg. 
a variety of products, consumer interest, um, how we can segment the market and where demand is going. So I do anticipate that our project will have um, a lot of impact because if there's no demand, you can build it and they will come and we have to get beyond CBD. So um, I hope I did okay, Dan, with answering your questions. And um, now I will turn it over to Thank you. Slide show. Um, can everybody see that? Uh, so this, yes. I will talk a little bit about consumer perceptions of hemp, an application of the theory of buyer behavior and the diffusion of innovations. And this is a joint work with my um, graduate student who is entering the PhD program at UVM. We have a new PhD program in sustainable development, policy, economics, and governance. And um, she was just fantastic and has uh, been really a, an integral part of the team. And I couldn't do this presentation without her. Um, she's so much more talented than I am. So I'm going to skip this. You know that it's a, um, there's a renewed interest as was just uh, mentioned, and there are as many as 50,000 new um, products or products that can be made from hemp. And I wish I could I see the little box is covering up my presentation. Let's see if I can move that. So, you know, we know that there's a renewed interest in hemp. We, you know, that's why we're all here and we're interested in it. Almost a hundred of us, I, I believe. But if you look at um, articles uh, in the news by search term and um, internet search interest by search term, you can see that we really did peak in 2019 with regard to looking for hemp. And the implications of this are many producers, marketers, sellers of hemp product have been riding the public relations wave, that they haven't really thought that they had to invest money in advertising and integrated marketing communications. And I am here to say, just looking at these, um, these large statistics over time is that um, the market isn't going to um, build itself, that there's going to have to be some communication um, with the consuming public. And therefore you need to know who your target market is. So we obviously need consumer behavior research. And most of it has thus far has looked at the relationship between consumer demographics and CBD products. And I think, Dan, you were on a, a it must have been a year ago now, we were on another one of these workshops that came out of Colorado State. And the stakeholder said that um, consumer and market information was one of the most important uh, needs that the industry had. So what we found, thus far is that demographic data alone are insufficient and that there is a gap in knowing about what the influence of per perceptions of a variety of topics surrounding hemp um, on use is. So the first, looking at the theory of buyer behavior, you know, you can look at a new product category. Rarely can you look at a new product category, right? Brand new. There's always something that's, uh, that's coming up behind it, but hemp really is new as Suzanne said. So you can look at how many people are aware or unaware, but more than that, you have three sets. You have a choice set. Those are people who are actually using it. You have an inert set, which means, wow, I don't really know what I want to do. I need more information. I haven't decided to adopt or reject. And then you have, of course, the rejection set of those um, consumers who say, I will never use this product. So uh, this research really tries to just begin to get at, uh, at, separating out choice, inert, and rejection sets of consumers and then classifying into typologies. When you look at the diffusion of innovations, you can look at what influences adoption and um, products or services or whatever it is that you've got for sale should have a relative advantage, be compatible with the way people do things, be simple to use. You have to be able to watch other people do it and you have to make it easy to try. This is a, you know, this is a, the standard theory of the diffusion of innovations. So we have a statistically representative online survey of Vermonters. Um, we're starting with Vermont because this was paid for by the Agricultural Experiment Station for the University of Vermont. And this is gonna be launched into a national survey in the next couple of, of months. So we looked at our independent variables of including diffusion of innovations, perceptions about hemp, including THC content, input requirements um, that would might be sustainability or resilience, 
um, of the land base, environmental friendliness, uh, regulatory impact, and uh, the importance of local. And we also included political questions because we found in our early research that um, that link between between marijuana as a, being a drug and hemp being not a drug is really still remains strong. So we looked at medicinal marijuana legislation and recre recreational marijuana legalization. And of course we included, um, we did include our demographics and we looked at a variety of products, starting with CBD, clothing, construction materials, food products, paper, personal care products, plastic, and rope. Some of which uh, those products have been around for a long time, read rope, and some which really aren't developed. And I think the only plastic that I have seen is Legos, um, but they could be farther. And then the developing construction material, um, the developing construction material industry. Um, so, and so whoever's keeping time, just make sure um, that you stop me. So we looked, we did a, a two-step model looking at a probit to determine probability of awareness. And then we use multinomial logits to determine the probability of placement into choice sets, inert sets, and rejection sets once people are aware. Pretty, pretty standard um, double hurdle. And so when we look at awareness, there's uh, quite a high awareness of CBD clothing and and rope and personal care products, and of course, less in the emergence, the emerging um, industries. And then what set are people in? And uh, we can look at rejection set being the, the, uh, the kind of uh, orange line, the inert set, which means people have not made up their mind, and the choice set. And so there's a lot of room when you look at that brown column to say people really haven't made up their mind, and the industry has to find out who the consumers are and to target those consumers with the right information and communication. And then I, you know, I could go into, you know, all of the, um, the results here and you can see in blue, these are our significant variables, but I, I can actually skip all this. We did this for CBD, clothing, construction materials, food products, paper, personal care products, plastics and rope. So um, if, if I go back, let's just go quickly and say, you know, let's look at what everybody has been looking at and that's uh, per CBD products. So we've got a 39% probability of having chosen that, a 36% probability of rejecting that and still a quarter of, of the, uh, a quarter probability or 25% probability of not making your decision yet. And on the left-hand side, I don't know if you can see my arrow, but again, when we look at clothing, few people are actually choosing it. The largest probability is people who haven't made up their mind, 47% probability. The same thing with food, 48% haven't made up their mind. More than half haven't made up their mind about paper. You can think about packaging. You can think about cardboard boxes. You can think about Amazon. Um, Personal care products, almost 50% haven't made up their mind. Plastics, not really enough information to tell. Um, rope, again, almost 50% uh, 50 probability of, you know, there's opportunity there in these markets. And then finally, if, um, if we look at this, this is in a nutshell, um, the, the different products that we looked at, the uh, variables that are important in predicting awareness and the variables that are important at the bottom of this in placing people in um, and pl placing people in the choice, the inert or the rejection set. And remember rejection are the red variables, um, the red, uh, the words highlighted in red or the variables highlighted in, in red, inert are the green, and choice uh, inert are the brown and choice are the um, are the green. So different influencers um, for people choosing to use the different products. So we can see there are different markets, different characteristics of hemp, um, and um, different characteristics for people who will reject the the products. 
So the characteristics influencing hemp consumption vary by the, the different products and relative advantage and trialability are particularly influential across products. You've got to show that there is a benefit and what that benefit could be depending on your consumer. Environmental benefit makes it easy for me. It, it works if it's a beauty product. And then, um, you know, trialability. There's a lot of things that we can do to make hemp trialable. And I think of my extension colleagues and the places where they do demonstrations and so on. Um, lots of ways to, to show how people can use this and make it easy to try. Now, you know, we need to also emphasize the difference and the distinction between uh, marijuana and hemp. Um, hemp, as we all know, is not a drug, yet we see this linkage. And I think, um, I think that if I, I, I think that Rebecca's going to talk a little bit about this, uh, but our glossary group, as we call our wonderful group of grad students working on the content analysis of the plans, um, the plans are really focused on, um, on making sure that hemp is not drugs. And that seems to be the, the focus. And it, it was just, it was interesting and um, surprising to me uh, that the, the plans talked very little about other, other things except um, controlling, regulating, not letting hemp that is, uh, has more than 0.3% THC into the market. So um, there was also importance of local, which gives an opportunity to um, smaller local producers, niche markets, rural community development. They, they might command a price premium and develop some niche markets for uh, local rural communities. So there's community development implications. And then the sustainability framing might be helpful, which, and, and of course, this is part of the, uh, the the new rubric of uh, USDA interest, which is looking at sus uh, sustainability. So I think the study provides a starting point for comprehensive marketing strategies and to aid the success of the emerging market. It's just the tip of the iceberg. And as I said, we'll be going national very soon. So with that, I'll stop. Great. Great. Thank you, Jane. That was perfect on, on time. Oh, was I? Oh, this wonderful. I'm so glad. <laughs> in, your, in your mind. So thank you so much. Um, you know, let's open it up for a few minutes with questions from folks in the audience. If you wouldn't mind, if you're out there and you have a question, if you could type it in the chat or raise your hand. There, we're a pretty big group, so I think it'll be tough if people just speak up. No question, Suzanne. Oh my gosh, maybe maybe I'll ask one myself then. <laughs> um, you know, I was listening, Jane, that was fascinating and thank you so much. I wonder if you might just comment on this distinction between sort of awareness and availability because I saw availability pop up um, in some of your results. Yeah, so you know, you know that you can't make a choice unless you are aware, and oftentimes, if it's not available, you can't make a choice either. So, um, I, I, from my own training in consumer behavior, it's that you cannot just build something and and something will come, you know, and the people will come. If I put it out there, people will come. If I just make it available, no, there has to be a targeted um, or a comprehensive communication campaign that goes along with that to show um, why people should perhaps try this product once they're aware. So awareness is just the first, the first step. And people are aware of these products, yet they're just entering or diffusing into the marketplace. So um, I think we, we have a lot more to learn about um, how we can make the right products available at the right place, at the right time, um, et cetera. Great. But I, I think the, the crux of all this is don't forget that you cannot rely just on mass media these days to, um, to, to get the word out about hemp. 
Great, thank you. Um, let's see, we have a question in the chat. This is from, from James Stearns. So he's asking about sort of basic stats about the questionnaire, who, who was in the population, you know, sort of size of the sample, that kind of thing. And, and I'm just gonna add on my own little question to the end of that, because you've mentioned a couple of times that the goal is to have this roll out nationally in the near future. Um, could you just, you know, elaborate a little on that as well? Sure, I'll just go over that quickly. You know, this is our annual Vermonter poll. Um, Vermont is often used as a bellwether for a lot of different products. First, first in the country to have civil unions, you know, first in the country to have GMO labeling. Um, so I, you know, people say you're a little state, you know, up there in the Northeast, but oftentimes Vermonters results tend to um, permeate what goes on in the rest of the country. So this, I would consider these to be pilot results. We have done this for three years. I only presented the 2021 results. So this is 700 people, um, a, a sample of 700 people, which is representative. But as you know, when you do survey research, you're going to get uh, a higher educated, um, higher income population. Um, so, you know, so it is what it is, right? If we can say that we're within, you know, we're, we have, a, we're within 10%, we have a 95 10 sample, we're 95% confident we're within 10% of the population of Vermont. But, um, you know, it's a, it's a pilot, um, but it's a start. And we have used the development of this survey to develop our, our national survey and learn from what we've found out. Okay. There's a, a follow-up question in the chat asking about the national survey as well. Um, and this is from Benjamin Jacobs. Do you know how long the national survey would run um, and any more specifics on how the data will be used or published? And then he's asking a question, will there be any opportunity to access data from that survey? Right, so um, yes, of course, in the long run, you know, we're supposed to have open access data, but not until we have first choice on publishing our results. And as an academic, I, um, you know, we will be publishing in academic journals, but my work is always applied. So hopefully it will be useful to people and will be translated from academic journals into other types of outreach and education material used by extension, used by producers, um, uh, marketers, et cetera. So um, it's not even in the field yet. And we haven't even uh, purchased our sample yet. And that's probably, it's probably gonna be a Qualtrics sample that is representative of the, of the US. So uh, stay tuned, by next July, we should have wonderful results. I wish it could be tomorrow, <laughs> but it's, it's, not, uh, it's not going to be. Um, we also are, have fielded a national dis, uh, discrete choice experiment for CBD, and that one is going to be expanded to other products. And I think clothing is our next, um, is our next choice. And that particular survey is also going out to our advisory and stakeholder board so that we can get an idea of are the producers and the manufacturers and the business side on the same uh, wavelength as the consumers when we talk about characteristics and uh, willingness to pay for these different products. So we're gonna try to get a, a view from both sides. Great, thank you. Um, there's been quite a bit of back and forth in the chat talking about um, CBD as a drug um, and then how it's classified. I'm going to ask you guys to hold on to those comments right now. We're going to have a lot of discussion time at the end, and I think that's probably a bigger issue that, that may come up there. But we want to turn to our second panelist right now. Um, so. Uh, Tyler Mark is up next. Uh, Tyler is an associate professor at University of Kentucky and has um, been involved in these discussions and um, hemp and what's going on in the hemp world um, since the very beginning. And so I think he's sort of a, a font of knowledge on, on many, many questions. So Tyler, we're gonna turn it over to you. You can share your screen and um, take it away. Excellent, thank you, Suzanne. And uh, first off, I'm gonna say thank you to all the regulators and everybody else who's on the call. 
Uh, I know this was kind of sent out short notice, uh, and to see the response here, that's that's been pretty phenomenal. And and uh, you know, Gary, I'll try and touch on a few of the the comments that you're making. And you're right, CBD itself is still a drug. Uh, we've got lots of issues with the Delta Eight components uh, that are coming out, and and I think uh, from a little bit of the research that I'm going to show here. Uh, you're going to see that there's still a lot of confusion in the market, and it, and it does kind of sway and impact uh, some of these consumer surveys that are coming out. And we can talk more about that um, as we go forward and, and hopefully as we have time at the end. And I'll try and keep an eye on the chat and, and present and everything else all at the same time. Uh, but let's go on and jump into, um, you know, kind of the presentation uh, piece that I kind of have uh, laid out and uh, Dan, can you see my presentation? Yes, I can. All right. So I'm going to touch a little bit on a, on a presentation we're doing um, or on a, on a little bit of work we're doing. It's uh, on hemp demand. Uh, and I'll give you some specifics uh, on that here in a second. But I'm going to kind of go in reverse situation of what uh, Jane did uh, in that I'm going to talk about all the different projects I kind of have going on towards the end. Um, of this presentation. But this is uh, some research that's being headed up by myself, Ben Campbell, uh, Brandon McFadden, and, and Adam Robin Robinowitz. Um, so this, uh, this is really looking at a consumer survey um, that, that we have going. Uh, let's see. And this is all the group that's involved. In, and I'm going to try and put logos and stuff in here so that you know exactly where um, where a lot of this research has been done, so that you can, or where it's at, so that you can see it uh, and how it might pertain some to your state. Uh, this is a national survey that we're doing. Uh, it's about a thousand observations, or it is a thousand observations a month. That's kind of distributed uh, the same as the national pop national population term of demographics. Uh, and we started that survey, and it's a monthly survey that's going out. Uh, what I'm going to start here with is February through April of 2021. Uh, but we, we're trying to roll this out um, and have monthly reports, and you'll see the, the website that we're doing that at here in a second. Um, but it's really on the demand for hemp products. I will say right now, uh, the focus is kind of on that CBD market, and, and you'll see here in a minute that there's a lot of confusion in that market um, and what's going on and the differences between the marijuana market and the CBD market. And there's lots of consumer knowledge gaps. Uh, I should also think this this project is uh, funded by USDA EMS. Um, if any of you are on the call uh, from there, thank you for for that. Um, and and I think this is really important as we go forward and and as this new crop develops, as Suzanne was talking about. And also, feel free to reach out to me at the end of this presentation if you would like to have the presentation so that you can have all the links and stuff. I've dumped a bunch of hot links in here uh, so that you can kind of have uh, access to that uh, all at the end. But this is our Hemp Economic Marketing and Policy Group, uh, aka Hemp Group, um, that's working on this project. And, and we're starting to put up these monthly reports. And what, as I said, what I'm going to show you here in a minute is from that monthly report. But we'll have monthly um, reports coming up on this website. Um, we've got one out, and we'll, we'll be getting the next one out pretty soon. So uh, there is a little bit of a lag on this. But... Uh, you know, we're, we're really trying to get uh, this information out there as fast as we can because we, we know that it's important uh, for the processors and for the development of this industry. Uh, hopefully, as this uh, project goes on, we'll be able to touch more on some of these Delta-8 issues um, and some of the other uh, nuances uh, within this industry and also move more into the fiber and grain uh, components of this market. And I've got a couple of my colleagues on the, on the call, so hopefully I haven't uh, put them in a tight spot uh, that that we're going to move in that direction as well. So, but I think there's there's a whole lot of um, a whole lot of ground to cover. So the first thing that we kind of started out doing um, is looking at some word associations. So if you answer uh, this survey, uh, this national survey that's going out on a monthly basis, um, we're we're collecting all the the first words and familiarity really uh, or word associations that you have with this, and this really where it starts to hit you in the face, as that um, you know. People don't really understand the difference between hemp and marijuana, uh, and they don't understand the nuanced piece to that, uh, which may become null and void given some of the uh, some of the the uh, new rules and regs that may be coming out uh, in terms of, or at least some of the bills and stuff that have been proposed um, in Congress. So we'll see how the, all that plays out 
but it's really interesting uh, to see that. So as soon as that you hear the word hemp or CBD, marijuana, weed, uh, those types of uh, uh, comments come out, which I think is really, um, and to some degree, Delta 8 even, even messes, uh, even gets those markets even closer together and in more competition uh, as Delta 8 is that uh, isomer after you get the CBD production, uh, you take it on uh, to get the Delta-8, which does have a psychoactive component as well. So the policy space in that um, is, is really kind of fascinating. And I would say that the, the, the big animal in the room, uh, when it comes down to a lot of this and this uh, not really understanding these two markets, uh, is FDA really hadn't come down and, and made a ruling as to where they're gonna go. But at the same token, uh, with some of these products that are coming out, we need some regulation uh, in this space or we're going to, we could run the risk of, of really um, having a, a safety or a safety issue uh, with a lot of these products with, with the way some of them are being manufactured. Uh, and we need some good manufacturing and those types of things uh, to continue to move this industry forward, especially on the CBD uh, side, of the thing, side of the coin. So one of the other questions, um, and I'm only going to present about eight or six or eight of the questions out of the survey. The question, the survey is 45 or 50 questions long, um, and we'll have more detail coming out uh, on that as well. But if you look at this, um, it's really interesting that if uh, you're a consumer of, of, of these CBD products, those consumers seem to be pretty loyal, and they're, they're either taken daily or weekly. Now, you will see um, in the April side of here, uh, we, we had something happen that uh, more weekly consumers than daily consumers, uh, we're still trying to understand and suss some of this out uh, as to why there was the big change in April uh, that happened. But the proportion of consumers, about 50% plus, are consuming either weekly or daily. So we, we have a lot of consumption. So once you get started, you tend to, uh, to be a pretty big consumer. Uh, within our data set, we also have how much you're spending on a weekly basis. Uh, we haven't reported that out here yet. Uh, but uh, that is in there. There have also been two other uh, studies that have been done by New Frontier Data uh, in 2019 and 2020. One, the 2019 was in Europe, the 2020 was done in the U.S. Uh, that we're, we're comparing uh, some of our stuff to as well. Um, the five most important CBD attributes, at least for the consumer side of this, so we do have our data set broken up into consumers and non-consumers. Uh, price is definitely one of the, the key drivers of that, uh, but if you pay attention to the biomass prices and uh, the, all the products that are made out of this, prices on that are still coming down. Uh, when I looked uh, last week or earlier this week, um, you know, in a lot of places in the country, they were down between, uh, you know, 30 cents to 70 or 90 cents uh, per percent CBD. Um, you know, so there, those prices have come way, way down since uh, July of 2019, which would have been uh, basically the peak of those prices. So this still hadn't processed all the way through the supply chain yet, uh, but I expect that these prices will continue to come down. Uh, they're also paying a lot of attention to total amount of CBD. So that's uh, been a really big issue um, in that space and, and is what's actually labeled on the bottle, what's actually in the bottle. Um, that's a that's a problem uh, that we've seen in some of the anecdotal stuff that we've done here at UK, looking at um, and testing those labels versus what they say is on the label. Medical recommendations, so Gary, this kind of gets back a little bit uh, what you're talking about. There are some medical claims being posted um, on uh, on some of these uh, um, products. Uh, you've also seen a lot of FDA letters go out um, about posting uh, medical claims on those, but there are a lot of people that are taking it for quote unquote medical recommendations. Um, not always, uh, you know, we, we haven't seen the data yet from the human trials to, to know where, where exactly uh, this is gonna fall in that, in that paradigm. Top five reasons for not taking um, um, for non-consumers. <clears throat> There's a big chunk of the population that's not interested um, in it, uh, potentially because of, uh, you know, their feelings about the market, um, their feelings about the market versus, uh, you know, uh, they just, they just don't have a medical or a, a desire to take the, the product. So that's been kind of an interesting one. 
uh, don't know enough. So I think this, again, goes to a lot of that education component and all the confusion that's taking place in this market uh, as we, we continue to look at this. These are numbers that, um, you know, kind of kind of shocked me when we got this back. And that's a portion of self-reported CBD consumers. Um, and it's it's pretty much 40% and above of those thousand observations that were taken are, are saying that they're consumers. So that's that that's a little shocking to me, given that um, you know a lot of anecdotally, as I talk uh, at a lot of different meetings around, you may hear somewhere between ten and twenty percent. So um, we're, we're still trying to figure this out um, a little bit, and we, we probably need to clarify um, what all is going on in our data with this uh, to to think about why this may be so high. Uh, but it has been a pretty consistent trend uh, that we are seeing in the data. Um, one other kind of bright spot um, in this, which I find kind of interesting, is that uh, the non-consumers, non-consumers, about 30, almost 30% of them say that within the next month, uh, they're likely to try a CBD product. So that's, that's kind of an interesting piece uh, as this market continues to develop and I think an opportunity uh, for this. But now keep in mind, um, we, we talk, we're, we're focusing a lot here on the CBD side of the coin. But, but keep in mind, CBD relative, uh, it doesn't take a whole lot of acres uh, to produce enough CBD to, to satisfy really a lot of the demand that's taking place in the U.S. And, and James uh, Stearns hit on that early in one of his publications. Uh, and, you know, and we're starting to see that really play out in 2019, 2020, when those prices came down precipitously, uh, that we just don't have enough demand to, to handle all that. Um, all that production, we've still got a lot of production that's sitting uh, in barns and and, uh, and super sacks and in storage uh, and crude sitting around the country. Um, so that's been one of the problems and somebody hit on that about the processors not being um, in the chat box, hit on the processors not being reliable. Uh, and that's really a function of this industry being an infant industry and trying to develop the, the rules and framework around this. Um, so going forward with this, uh, I still think there's a lot of market confusion, education of consumers. Jane kind of played on some of this as well. Uh, and some of her uh, her work earlier in the Vermonter poll and that, you know, consumers really need to understand what this is. Uh, I think we're going to have to spend some time educating those consumers, uh, especially once the, the human trials come out um, and for this market to continue to grow. Uh, price point, I think, is going to continue to be important, and those prices are going to continue, I think, to come down uh, at the retail side of, of the coin. Um, you know, if you pass that all the way back uh, through to the production side, I think you're going to start to see prices. Somebody made a comment about uh, really high plant costs. I think those are going to continue to come down, too, so we can lower that cost of production. And, and Dan's really going to talk about the cost of production survey we're working on here in a little bit. Uh, and I think we'll have a, a more clear picture of what that looks like uh, once that survey has been uh, completed, uh, hopefully within uh, sometime later this year. Um, we still need to do a lot more understanding of the non-consumers uh, and there seem to be opportunities uh, uh, to pick up um, some additional consumers going forward in this market. So those are, those are some things I'm kind of looking forward to in this research. Um, like I said, we've still got a whole lot more information to, to pull out of this survey. Um, and we'll, we'll keep getting that information posted uh, on the website uh, that you saw uh, earlier. So what else are we working on for hemp? Um, and uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna touch on a lot of different projects just so that everybody's kind of familiar with what all's going on. And most of this is all stuff that I'm involved in. Uh, and I realize that there are other projects going on around the country uh, on drift and, and a few other things as well. So, uh, but these are, these are all the things that uh, I'm uh, pretty well involved with. So this first one, uh, and this is the project uh, Jane was talking about uh, when we're looking at economic impact um, of this group. Uh, so we have a consumer survey coming out. We've got a little bit of producer work. Uh, this is a NIFA funded project and we're looking across, um, and this should say extraction side, uh, not essential, uh, but grain fiber and extraction industries and trying to develop out these uh, multipliers. And Rebecca's also um, really involved with this project. Uh, this has been a lot, of, a lot of fun to work with. And I think 
hopefully soon we'll get out the glossary and, and I'll look for feedback, especially from a lot of the, the regular regulatory uh, community uh, on that as we try and um, rein in some of the different terminology that's being used uh, around the industry. So we have a common set of language so everybody's on the same page uh, as we go forward. And I, I think that that will also help on the governmental side too, as we continue these discussions into the 2023 Farm Bill. Another project that I just got a chance to meet on last week uh, in Baltimore is really looking at uh, risk uh, managing risk and hemp production contract development crop insurance decisions. So we have this crop insurance program, it's one year old. Uh, I saw Andrew uh, from RMA was on the call as, today as well. Uh, we got a chance to hear from him and, and to talk a little bit about this, but we're, we're really looking at uh, what the crop insurance actually has um, you know, in it. How does it how does it protect what are potential options, potential pitfalls um, of the crop insurance program that's out there? Uh, we're also in the process of trying to put together some basic contracts, best management practices for these contracts. Now, realizing in probably 2021, if you look across the 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 hemp uh, sphere, I would say there's probably not a whole lot of companies offering contracts because there's so much out there on the spot market that they can purchase kind of whatever they want. So that creates then a problem within uh, the crop insurance kind of side because you have to have um, a contract to get crop insurance. So, you know, there's some mismatch of what all's going on in the industry, but this is something from this project uh, with my colleagues from the University of Maryland, uh, UT, uh, down in Knoxville and Drake University are looking at um, going on there. Um, then we're also looking at fostering a well-rounded uh, sustainable hemp industry in the U.S. This is a project, ARS project, uh, here at the University of Kentucky. Uh, and I saw several of my colleagues that are working on this uh, on the call as well today. So thank you all for joining. Uh, but we're really looking at um, a lot of the pricing structures. So a lot of the pricing right now is based on uh, percent CBD or, or pounds or uh, if you're in the grain and fiber side. So what's the right metric to use. I mean, is it is it really the only the only cannabinoid that's in this is is CBD? Is that the only one that really matters in the CBD side of the market or the extraction market? I don't really think so because I think there's a lot of other cannabinoids, terpenes, uh, and other products in there that that um, can have pricing to them. So do we need to think about how we change that pricing structure uh, as this industry continues to develop? We're also looking at a little bit at hemp feed. I know there's another project going on at Kansas State. Uh, looking at uh, feeding grain um, to livestock, as well as another project down at Murray. Uh, Murray State University has completed a couple of uh, projects looking at that on the poultry side. Uh, we're looking primarily at the beef side here. Uh, we're also looking at land use change um, and potential land use changes as this crop comes in and out of production and how it fits into the rotation um, with a lot of other crops here. So. So it's been a really exciting project that, that we're continuing to move forward here. Uh, this is the project that Dan's gonna talk about. This is uh, a large project that uh, we're working on with AMS, trying to launch the first national survey of uh, hemp production costs. And I will say, uh, hopefully to all the regulators on the, on the, the call today that uh, we'll be coming to you with more information on this uh, very soon. Uh, we're, we're still trying to jump through all the uh, uh, governmental hurdles. Uh, I think we're almost there um, and we'll, we'll be looking to launch this late uh, this fall. Uh, we're also looking at some market channel assessment stuff and, and maybe Dan will touch a little more on that. Uh, but this has really been coordinated uh, and, and kind of the collaboration with the uh, National Agricultural Statistics Service that this fall has their uh, uh, acreage and production survey coming out as well. So I think these will kind of be two time surveys one will focus more on the acreage and production, the other will focus more on a lot of the production costs, the economic uh, components of that. Uh, and again, thanks to uh, AMS for, for funding to work on this project. Then, you know, just other projects that we have going on um, here at the University of Kentucky within the group that I have uh, that works here. Uh, we're looking at a lot of the international markets and, and what, what's out there. Um, what type of opportunities can U uh, U.S. products have in other countries along with trade? Um, hemp, you know, if we're gonna destroy these crops, what's that gonna cost? Uh, there, there is a, a cost to doing that. Uh, we've got a, a document out on contracting, another one on lots of stuff on budgeting. Uh, I saw Doris Hamilton's on the call as well. She knows this is coming. Uh, 
hopefully sometime soon, a review of the Kentucky Hemp Program since 2014. We've been making really good progress on that. Um, I was part of another project that did the national needs for hemp. Uh, and as I said, I've got all these hot linked in here if you, if you want to get to those. Uh, international hemp regulations. I've got another student that's been working on that. We've been also working on U.S. processing capacity, and I think that's been one of the big hurdles uh, in this industry. And we, as we talk about, are we do we have too much processing, not enough processing? And and I think you could make an argument for both sides of that, uh, depending upon how you you wanted to to go at that uh, argument. Jane mentioned the hemp metrics uh, project. I, I was lucky enough to uh, to sneak my way into uh, helping the University of Vermont develop a lot of the hemp metrics. And um, and I've uh, got the, the paper linked in here to that. And then I, I have some other announcements coming soon, but I can't really say too much about those yet. But there's there's a lot more on the hemp front uh, that uh, that me and my collaborators have been working on uh, that uh, hopefully soon we'll be able to make some additional announcements. I would be remiss if I if I didn't um, didn't tell you that uh, all this is possible as a result of. of all the great people that I have that, that really work behind me. Uh, and uh, all of them are here. I'm missing, actually, I'm missing one other additional undergraduate student, uh, but we, we have a pretty big uh, econ hemp team here um, that, that, that help with uh, get all these projects uh, wrangled and put together. So with that, I'm gonna be quiet. Uh, feel free to ask questions. Um, and, uh, I'll try and get uh, this posted or out uh, to those that I've seen in the chat that have had uh, additional comments. So Great, some... thank you, Tyler. That was perfect, exactly on time to the minute. So <laughs> perfect. Um, I, I'm gonna, there was one question in the chat earlier. I'm gonna um, ask or pass that one along. This came from Doris. And you touched on it briefly, but but you might want to elaborate a little. She was asking, how do the how do the price decreases um, at the wholesale and the retail levels compare? Or can you say something about that? You know, that's, loaded question. Yeah, yeah, that's um, you know, Doris, that's that's one of those areas we've been able we we haven't really been able to get a good handle on, and part of that's a function of. Uh, when you get at the retail level, everybody has a different size. There's no standard, right? So everybody has a different size uh, tincture or a different uh, uh, dosing amounts um, so or, or amounts that are supposed to be in that. So we haven't went out to the point of, of trying to capture all those retail uh, components. My, my feeling is that those prices are far more sticky uh, than the prices at the wholesale level uh, right now. So that, that's kind of what I'm thinking um, on that. And, you know, I'd be interested to hear your input on that as well, too. And I, hopefully that jives with what you're seeing. But um, maybe if I can uh, find some time for uh, some of these students, uh, if, I can, if I can break them loose from some other things, we can, we can have some time to, to really think about how to put that uh, together and come up with a better answer for you. Now, one thing we are in the process of doing, um, not necessarily at the retail level, but we are looking at... Uh, some of the different pricing agencies that are out there or price reporting agencies, uh, we are starting to look at how do their prices compare uh, across because one of the finding these prices is a bit tricky. Um, most of this is probably at the farm level and at the processor level in terms of different extracted products. Um, you know, we're starting to compare how, how these different pricing agencies are doing that and, and are they similar or the same? because that impacts then how some of these processors, if there are contracts that they're utilizing a different pricing agency, how they might price that. So th that is one area we are looking at that I didn't have on there. Um, and we should have something coming out on that pretty soon as well. Great, thank you so much. Um, we're gonna move on to the next presenter, but don't forget everybody, there's gonna be plenty of time at the end for, for questions for all of the panelists and for more discussion and hopefully more audience input. So I wanna uh, move on now to our next presenter, Rebecca Hill, and she's gonna to talk to us a little bit about sort of federal and state programs and 
um, perhaps how those fit together. I'm not sure, I don't wanna put words in her mouth, uh, but Rebecca's an extension specialist at Colorado State University and gets a special thanks for running our little poll at the beginning of this. So Rebecca, are you ready to go? Yes, definitely. Let me, um, sorry, I lost my PowerPoint to share it. There we go. Let me know if you see the note slides instead of the presentation. No, it's good. Yeah, All right, yeah great. perfect. So thank you, everybody. I'm really excited to see so many people on the call. I'm going to talk a little bit about kind of the evolution of federal and state hemp programs. But after seeing the poll and seeing who is on this call, um, I am not going to say that I'm an expert in these federal programs more than all of you that are here from the USDA and the, the federal agencies. So please step in, feel free. Maybe we can talk a little bit about it. So I'm just going to go over the federal um, programs and kind of give some context to that. But where our real or my real expertise has been is looking at Colorado and how Colorado has really navigated this, this policy and regulatory environment or this context. So let's start with the federal. I'll give a brief overview. And again, all of you that are here working for the federal government, please feel free to interject. Um, but kind of a brief history of hemp in the United States has been kind of interesting. Hemp has been produced throughout um, U.S. history. Um, one statistic that's kind of become popular from a report by Renee Johnson with the Congressional Research Service. In 1943, the U.S. did have 146,000 harvested hemp acres, so not insignificant. But if we look a little bit forward, there was no legal hemp planted after 1958. And there were several reasons for this. So in the 1800s, um, cannabis was thought of as a medicine, right? And it was kind of, you could go to the doctor or the pharmacy and get your, your medicine. Um, since then, it kind of changed to becoming something that, that people started to think of as dangerous and immoral. And, and you could see this happening with the Marijuana Tax Act. And um, so no legal hemp, planted after 1958, largely because of that Marijuana Tax Act. There was also other factors in place, competition from synthetic factors, and then that increasing um, public anti-drug sentiment. But then in, in around the 1990s, we saw kind of a renewed interest in hemp. Um, people started thinking about hemp, thinking about growing hemp again, what that would look like. And we saw significant changes finally to, that fed to federal hemp policies that allowed this um, in the 2014 Farm Bill. So the 2014 Farm Bill really provided that research institutions and state departments of ag could grow hemp under an agricultural pilot programs. And this agricultural act of the, the 2014 Farm Bill defined hemp as the plant, cannabis sativa L, and any part of the plant with a THC concentration of no more than 0.3% on a dry weight basis. And we've heard a little bit about this 0.3% people talking about it before, but this has become a point where uh, a policy point, and I'll talk about this when we talk about Colorado, that has become a little bit problematic or needs more research. So I'll kind of talk about that 0.3% a little bit as we move forward. And I pulled this just to kind of give a little bit of context on this 2014 Farm Bill. This is a, a publication by, I know Suzanne on the call, to Tyler on the call were co-authors. I don't know if anybody else on the call was a co-author on this, this report, Economic Viability of Industrial Hemp in the United States. But here you can see that once that 2014 Farm Bill allowed for these state pilot programs, we saw a lot of state pilot programs coming. Um, you can see these dark blue, and I think you can see my cursor, these darker blue states, and you can see why Kentucky and Colorado and such have been the people that are kind of leading some of this research. These are the the states that had pilot programs immediately. So these are kind of at 19, in 2019, how many years of experience had these states had? And so you can see um, Colorado and Kentucky, they, they were some of the states that had pilot programs that came right out in 2014. So in 2014, we saw lots of states starting to think about this and starting to develop some of their own pilot programs. Then came along the 2018 Farm Bill. And this 2018 Farm Bill really legalized the production of hemp as an agricultural commodity, and it removed it from that list of controlled substances. So it no longer was on the list of controlled substances like marijuana was. 
and it uh, mandated that creation of a rule outlining the provision um, for the USDA to approve plans submitted by the states and tribes for the domestic pub production of hemp. And we had what you hear the interim final rule, which was published in October 2019. So you'll hear a lot about that interim final rule. Um, and so states may enact their own programs, but they must be approved by the USDA. And so to give a little context for Colorado, under the interim final rule, um, it found Colorado's plan to be too lenient, and Colorado's plan was actually out of compliance. And we'll talk a little bit about what Colorado has done to try to um, create their state plan. Um, this addressed many of the problems that were found in the state pilot programs, and by 2019, hemp could be legally grown in most states, except for Idaho, Mississippi, and South Dakota. And then we saw in January of 2021, the final rule. And so it was opened up, that interim final rule was opened up for comments. Lots of comments were put in. I know Colorado spent a lot of time reading the interim final rule and putting in comments. And then in the 2021, um, Colorado was pleased with the new final rule and how many comments and what a good job incorporating a lot of these changes were made into this final rule. Um, the final rule even had a footnote banking some of the uh, comments from Colorado. So they took all of the comments on the interim final rule and put out a final rule in January 2021. And so that's kind of just a broad overview of kind of the federal context. And I'm going to pop into talking about the state context, which is really um, what I think is really interesting to see what Colorado has done. But first, I'm going to talk a little bit very briefly about that um, state hemp plans content analysis that I think every one of our speakers so far has alluded to a little bit. This is that um, analysis that's been done by some great uh, graduate students at the University of Vermont looking at looking at and comparing all of the state plans. And then I'm going to talk, um, spend most of my time talking about the Colorado Hemp Advancement Management Plan and how Colorado has really engaged the stakeholders in the hemp industry and used that engagement to inform both our state hemp plan and how we're going to proceed going forward with hemp policy. So this is my one slide on that state hemp plan content analysis, and I want to give a big call out or a shout out to the graduate students that have been really working really hard on this. They read and evaluated and looked for, combed through 69 state tribal hemp production plans and analyzed them for different terms. And how do they define these different terms? What terms are there? So give a call, a shout out to Amanda, Amelia, and Jonathan for all their work that they've been doing on this. And we're excited to get this out in the near future so all of you can kind of see what's going on with the different hemp plans. And hopefully this can help us develop a glossary. But basically what they did is they looked at all 69 of these plans, gathered all the terms and definitions presented in these plans. They identified 421 different terms. And then they really analyzed 25 terms, which represented the 95th percentile of terms that appeared in 18 or more plans. And I know it's a little bit small to the right, but here are those 25 terms that we they really dug in and analyzed a little bit more. And kind of the interesting thing that they found here is that when they were looking at these terms, there was both a wide variety wide variety of variability in the terms that were seen in the plans, but also in the definitions of those terms across plants. And so we can think about the implications of this for um, clarity, right, as we're looking if these state plans are not consistently using the same terms, maybe there's some, some clarity and confusion around what these terms mean. And, and we know with hemp, there's a lot of interstate commerce going on. And if, if our plans aren't aligned and don't use the same terms, maybe there's some issues going on with that. So, and, and maybe in our discussion later, individuals might wanna talk a little bit more about what these graduate students have done with these different state plans. So a little bit into what Colorado is doing. So, 
we have in Colorado, so I put a, up here the title of an article um, that we got published in the Western Extension Forum um, with Dan Muini and Don Thilmany. And I can put, once I'm done presenting, I can put a link to this article if people want to read this, but making headway on the hemp industry in Colorado, the CHAMP initiative. And so the Colorado Hemp Advancement Management Plan has really been what Colorado has done to try to engage stakeholders. And I'll talk more about this plan. We had 202 stakeholders that engaged in this CHAMP initiative all across the supply chain. And we had conversations with them and it really has led to what Colorado policy is doing. And so to start out this CHAMP plan, what it really did is put out some of that data for everyone. We, we talked earlier about how there's a lack of data around hemp. Um, so this CHAMP plan kind of started out by kind of laying the groundwork. What, what is going on with hemp in Colorado? And so I put these up here just because I thought they might be interesting to people. That first uh, is a map showing 2018 registered hemp acres. So you can kind of see spatially where they are in Colorado. And then on the right, you can kind of see what's been happening with those hemp acres, both indoor square foot as well as outdoor acres. Um, over time. So Colorado has kind of been an early player and a big player. You can see that by the number of acres here. Um, some other just real quick kind of we try to put it into context. I think it's pretty interesting here. You can see these are planted acres. So you'll notice this looks a little bit different than this. These are planted acres, not registered acres. But you can kind of see where hemp falls in related to some of the other specialty crops that we grow in Colorado. So kind of putting it into context, um, you hear about Colorado potatoes a lot. Hemp is almost the same number of planted acres as potatoes in Colorado. So kind of to put it into context, um, we also found by looking at it, right, 52% here that that corresponds with one to 25 acres. So the registration sizes are fairly small. And then the difference between the registered acres, which is the blue here, and the harvested or the planted, or the planted, excuse me, the planted acres here in the orange. So in this um, CHAMP project, we first kind of laid out what is going on in the current uh, hemp industry. And so this Colorado Hemp Advancement and Management Plan um, we engage stakeholders, uh, as I said before, 202 stakeholders from across the supply chain. So you can see these are kind of the areas we targeted. So we recruited um, individuals in the state of Colorado that were working in R&D and seed and working in transportation, working in processing, manufacturing, marketing, finance, insurance. So we engaged people from all across these different parts of the supply chain. And kind of how it's kind of interesting to see how this project and the timeline of how this project worked. So the CHAMP project, we first established governments, governance, we had a board of directors, an executive committee. So this was a smaller group of individuals that were kind of important to um, Colorado hemp policy. They got together and kind of developed a plan. And from there, they started launching these stakeholder discussions. So we, we held stakeholder discussions for these um, four areas of the supply chain in this phase one. And then we held um, stakeholder meetings for these four areas of the supply chain in phase two. So we had these ongoing stakeholder discussions and we purposely put stakeholder discussions around cultivation and testing and R&D and seed and transportation first, because those are the ones that are going to be very important to how we engage our, how we develop and engage our state plan and how we engage with this new farm bill. And so we had these stakeholder discussions. We had at least two stakeholder discussions for each area across the supply chain. And they had around 30 individuals that were a part of that node in the supply chain. And while these stakeholder discussions were going on, th the lessons learned and the conversations that we had in these stakeholder discussions directly led into um, the verbiage and the creation of our state plan. Um, as well as a, a CHAMP report that we put out for Colorado. So we, we used these stakeholder discussions to directly um, influence our state plan. And I will, as I said, I will put in to the chat um, that article we had that kind of outlines this process a little bit better. But from this process, each of the stakeholder groups had to decide on some key recommendations that they thought was really important and we needed to focus on for their node of the supply chain as we moved forward as the state of Colorado 
um, developing hemp policy. So these are the 21 different recommendations that they dug into a little bit based on each node of the supply chain. And when I put this article that we put out in the Western Extension Forum, we give a little bit more description of each of these 21. And I know I only have 15 minutes, so I am not going to lay out each of these 21, but if we want to talk about any of them and lessons learned and, and kind of what that specific area of the supply chain was interested in and those we can dig into that in the discussion a little bit if we want to. Um, as part of this, you can imagine there were a ton of stakeholder meetings and between Don Filmini and I, we attended every single one of those stakeholder meetings. So we were able to get a good um, breadth of what was going on across the different areas of hemp in Colorado. And so from this, we really came up, so part of the chant process was coming up with seven different really overarching principles that are important to Colorado. Um, so the first one was to promote economic development across the supply chain. So that's that idea of establish, recruit, retain jobs, increase hemp production, and kind of support the industry. One thing that came out, it was really important to talk about the chain of custody and information sharing and how important understanding that chain of custody was for the success of the hemp industry. And a lot of the discussions across multiple nodes in the supply chain really revolved around how do we develop a traceability system that works across the supply chain. Um, a focus on THC control and the idea of how can we use certified seed or explore remediation of THC? What can we do to kind of focus on this THC control? Um, there was an overarching idea that yes, we need to um, be compatible with the federal programs, but we need to, as Colorado, advocate for reasonable regulations and really be future thinking. Thinking about what's going on in the hemp industry and how we can kind of keep progressing these federal regulations. Um, the importance of intergovernmental coordination. And it was interesting with this intergovernmental coordination, this was really broad um, from, we need to make sure that we are keeping our law enforcement involved in all of these discussions. And how do we make sure that all of the relevant agencies are involved in this? Um, the promotion of access to finance and insurance services. You can see how this was important to a lot of the stakeholders. Um, and then, which, which I think is interesting, there was, there was a, a lens of, from the stakeholders, the idea that we want this to be an equitable, diverse, and inclusive industry within Colorado. And so we, we need to keep an eye on that. Um, and so I'm trying, I also want to kind of answer those questions that Dan gave us at the beginning. Um, I talked a little bit about the research we were doing, a lot of my projects, other people on this uh, panel have been working on as well, so I'll kind of let them talk about that. But one of the questions that he asked is kind of what impacts has your project had? And I think it's been really rewarding working on this CHAMP project because it, it, it has had a lot, we've seen direct um, influence in how Colorado has developed their plan and because of this stakeholder involvement. This picture on the right, just yesterday, this is the press release out on a, a press uh, media um, event out on a hemp farm just yesterday where our state plan was finally accepted by the USDA. Um, that's our governor, Polis. And then you can see here, even Willie Nelson has talked about Colorado hemp policy, right? Colorado should be proud of leading the charge for the hemp industry. There are many ways that this crop can benefit both small family farmers and Americans in their everyday lives. And then what additional research is needed to inform this hemp sector? And that's kind of the next step. One of the things a lot of people talked about in our stakeholder meetings was the need for a, uh, a neutral clearinghouse to provide information to kind of advance the hemp sector. And so the next step in this CHAMP process has really been to put out what we're gonna call a Colorado Hemp Center of Excellence. Um, we're working on securing funding. It's, it's in this cycle of our, um, Colorado legislative cycle to start getting initial funding for this to provide research and education to the hemp sector, as well as development and pr 
promotion. Um, I have a list of some of the ideas that they've put out on this. There's a lot of different things that they want to come from this Colorado Hemp Center of Excellence, but some of the highlights have been um, looking at cross-contamination issues, um, stabilized seed genetics, certified seed programs, standards and metrics for quality, organic designation, water use and water schedule, clinical trials, feasibility studies. So there's a lot of different um, additional research that we're hoping will fall under this Colorado Hemp Center of Excellence in the future. And I hope I didn't go over in time. Great, thank you, Rebecca. That was, that was really interesting and I appreciate all the information. Um, and you did not go over on time. You are perfect. Everybody's been just right today. Um, if folks have a question, uh, go ahead and type it in the chat. Um, let's see, here's one that, uh, from Gary Fish, Rebecca. Can we get that final list, please? The final list of, uh, is that the list of things that the Colorado Hemp Center of Excellence wants to look at, or is this the list of priorities um, under the CHAMP initiative? You can get either one. Yeah. Gary, um, do you want to? Turn your mic on and just elaborate. Oh, here he, he typed. Last list you mentioned. Okay, definitely. I can get you that. And then I will put a link in here to um, the publication that kind of outlines that list of 21 recommendations that came out of the CHAMP initiative. Great. Thank you so much. Um, so I think we're going to go ahead and turn to our final panelist right now. And again, keep in mind that we're gonna have time at the end for, for questions that, that cross over the, the various presentations. And I know there's some issues that have come up in the chat, not necessarily people asking questions, but issues they've raised. And I've been kind of keeping track of those so uh, we can bring them back up at the end as well. But we want to turn now to Dan Mooney, our, our final panelist for today. Uh, Dan gets a special thanks for co-organizing this session, which has been great. He's an assistant professor and extension economist at Colorado State. So Dan, take it away. So Dan, I think we lost you, um, just lost your video. Um, okay, I think I'm back with audio. Yeah, we got the sound. All right, let me try that screen share again. Can you still hear me now? Yes. Okay, and great, and are you able to see this? Okay, perfect. Great. I'm connected to Zoom on my browser, so this is a new um, new experience. And do you see the presenter view? Uh, yes, but it's very small. It's not the full screen. That may be because you're coming. There you go. That's got okay. it. Okay, great. And we have audio, so we're we're good um so yeah thanks everyone for joining this has been a, a really terrific audience i'm glad to see that folks are engaged and i i picked up a lot along the way so i also want to thank the other um, presenters the topic i'm going to talk about is a national survey that will be um, done in partnership with the usda so ams and um, Suzanne at the Office of the Chief Scientist and Tyler Mark and other colleagues at the University of Kentucky. Um, so this, so I'm just the representative speaking about this survey, but there's been um, really innumerable number of people that have been involved in this and are helping shepherd this through different processes, different reviews, uh, providing feedback. And so, um, it, you know, it's really a recognition of that that group um, and collective effort. Um, 
So I just wanted to motivate, and I guess if I go back here for a second, so the survey is, is focused on um, trying to develop estimates of the cost of production and production practices. And so to motivate that um, a little bit, you know, as we've heard today, um, on the cultivation side, you know, it turns out that uh, we might be in a little bit of a, of a bubble with the economy. So there's been some overproduction um, and particularly, you know, stocks. So we've learned that hemp can store reasonably well, either in a processed form or a, a raw form. And that's really had an, a big effect on markets. And so, you know, maybe it, it, this was true a few years ago that hemp was worth its weight in gold um, or twice, but it's no longer the case. And so the big watershed moment for the cultivation of hemp were the two U.S. farm bills that reduced those barriers to entry and allowed growers to enter the market and respond. Um, but, you know, as we quickly realized, uh, more is not always better. And so, um, you know, production increased. Um, but the market, you know, demand side was really not able to um, grow at the same pace. And so that oversupply in production um, really precluded, um, you know, the sustainability of those price increases. And we've seen those come down. And, and you know, in certain cases, that's had really detrimental effects. Um, and so, you know, and we're, we're starting to see um, headlines of that. You know, I think they're in the news. There's been some um, lawsuits, you know, that you hear about. And, you know, when I say there's characteristics of a bubble, I think it's normal for some price reaction. Um, but, you know, where you have cases where people aren't necessarily basing pricing and investment and contracting decisions on, you know, rational expectations and, and really just thinking that, hey, I can sell this to somebody else at a higher price um, and, and they're in it to make money. Um, that's where we really start to see those um, got those warning signs. Um, arise. And so, you know, I think where we're at now is we, we're waiting for that watershed moment on the demand or consumption side. Um, and so we'll, we'll see what happens, you know, the next, next couple of years with some of the, the FDA decisions. <clears throat> and another recurring theme in terms of motivation for this, this national um, cost of production survey is information and really the dearth or lack of information that exists on the hemp industry. And you know, what information, basic information do we want um, to help inform, uh, you know, a new industry like hemp? Well, we want to know the size and location of growers, buyers, um, co competitors. There is information out there, but, you know, another theme has been how fast paced developments within the industry are. And so, you know, probably any data is old data based on how, how quickly um, things can transform. And so it's helped us understand our the the sector better the industry better um, but ultimately you know without without this really good timely information um, you know a lot of risky decision making can result and so we're trying to respond you know directly to those um, those concerns and, and help develop some new information that can be be useful in these areas um, so the state departments of ag have been a really terrific source of information a lot of summary statistics on um, licensing cultivation, um, helping separate out some of the differences between, um, you know, just licensing, uh, planting, harvesting. Um, the FSA has developed great information with um, the subset of growers that they work with, but not everyone uh, that is, is cultivating hemp, um, you know, is also tied in with the, the FSA um, data. There are a lot of advocacy and benchmarking organizations that publish um, market information and um, you know and, and a lot of that is uh, you know maybe regional in nature or um, it might actually be broader than cultivation and focus on some of the the marketing and processing um, operations that are out there and so it's, it's another source of information so this is a, a graph to kind of tie those pieces together, this is a graph that shows um, U.S. hemp acreage from 2014 to 2018. Um, Rebecca in the previous presentation showed more recent data, which shows obviously these acreage numbers decreasing, and that's continuing. So we're we're really seeing a you know more of a of an increase and then a decrease. But what I the reason I picked this particular figure is that the green bars show the acreage reported by states. 
and the gray bars report the acres um, reported by the FSA, the Farm Service Agency. So the FSA data will reflect um, folks that they already have an established relationship for. So those are more likely to be farmers, um, have production experience, um, whereas the, the green is going to combine those folks with anybody else who's growing hemp. So um, hemp producers you know, in Colorado that I'm most familiar with can range from several hundred acres for um, CBD and extraction purposes to you know, a handful of plants. Um, and it might be you know, 50 plants or a couple hundred plants. And so there's really a, a really wide diversity of folks and some of the smaller producers in particular might not have that farming and cultivation experience. And so I think some of the differences that we're seeing in the reported acreage um, you know, can not perfectly help us tease that out, but give us a sense of you know, how many acres are uh, being, being put into the, you know, the trusted money or the experienced uh, farming folks and, and maybe gives us a range of uh, those who have less experience. And uh, the other, um, you know, I think the, this is, maybe this is the small print here, but there's also this issue of outdoor cultivation, you know, on, on broader acreage and then greenhouse or indoor production. And so part of the difficulty with the acreage that's reported is it doesn't always report the same metrics measured the same way um, in terms of what it's including and not including. So there isn't good information out there. We can triangulate a little bit, um, but it's still a little bit variable. So what are we trying to accomplish with this um, cost of production and practices survey? It's really an, an information um, gathering exercise uh, focused particularly on those two aspects. So survey production practices. Um, we want to develop a representative understanding of the, the different hemp production systems that are out there and particularly practices that impact costs. So the second um, objective is we want to be able to um, look at production costs across na uh, at a national level but also across regions and states and for these different typical production systems. Um, and I'll dive into a little bit more depth here. So, and then uh, kind of a third or tertiary objective is to carry out some applied research. So we'll wanna summarize the raw data that we get, develop those representative um, statistics and develop a comprehensive report. So there are other efforts within the USDA, um, you know, to develop a representative understanding of yields and production and, and practices. So our goal isn't to overlap with those efforts, is really to focus more on the economic and cost piece and be able to address some of the applied um, research issues and inform in those spaces. So a little, so this is all looking ahead. Um, and so the, it's a kind of a nice transition, um, you know, from some of the previous um, presentations that, that looked at, you know, Kind of current and past data. Um, this, what will this survey entail as we begin to send it out? So currently we're planning to focus on the 2020 production year. Um, we're targeting a census of hemp growers. So um, Tyler and Suzanne are help, helping spearhead this. So looking at state partners um, and um, you know the census of folks who are admitted will be able to admit, help us administer the survey through the census of agriculture. Um, we'll be offering a mixed mode survey, so both a paper and online versions um, should be available. There, the survey was announced in the federal registrar. There was an open comment period, so we got some very um, good feedback that helped us implement some revisions um, to a, an earlier survey draft, and it's currently going under review. So I don't have a lot of specific um, detail. I do. Uh, include a link to that comment announcement in the Federal Registrar, so that gives some additional background about what types of questions um, and, and question categories are included. But hopefully, we'll, as Tyler's mentioned on a couple of occasions, we'll be able to start getting out some, some other information on that soon. <coughs> so a couple uh, aspects of the survey design is we, you know, this is something I wanted to highlight as we developed the survey, we actually ran into some difficulty thinking about, um, you know, how to frame the survey, what, what types of questions to ask, how to ask them. And 
you know, to really make the survey, uh, you know, interesting and relevant and salient to a number of different audiences. So what are, you know, some of the things we ran into um, for this hemp survey? The first is this idea of multiple production systems. So hemp can actually be viewed as several different commodities as opposed to one single commodity. So our survey organized the questions around different um, intended end uses. So we're looking at hemp for grain or oil seeds, um, fiber and pulp uses, and, and the cannabinoid extraction uses. So we were trying to write questions that were relevant to the cultivation of all of those different end uses at multiple scales. So capture the producers who are planting a handful of plants up to a couple hundred acres um, and looking at, you know, really commercially oriented producers with a lot of farming background and might have a lot of farming equipment machinery ownership versus folks who are just getting into it. Um, if they do produce at scale, they're probably custom hiring a lot of that production, um, you know, or even the smaller folks who might be doing a lot by hand. Uh, we have a lot of options like that um, in the response categories. So there's growers with very diverse backgrounds. So not all hemp growers, as has been mentioned, have farming experience. They might be unfamiliar with farm surveys and they're going to use a lot of different terminology. So we heard um, a summary of uh, different termin uh, terminology used in state hemp plans, um, you know, within the cultivation sector, you know, there might be an even broader variety of termin terminology um, that's used. And so how can we develop, you know, one, a single survey instrument that's really able to capture all of those um, backgrounds and experiences was a challenge. And so we spent a lot of time um, trying to, to come up with satisfactory um, ways to go forward. Um, and then the thinking about the enumeration component. So to really develop um, good cost of production estimates, we relied a lot on um, principles and question formats from the USDA ARM survey. And that's a very technical um, survey that's usually administered with a enumerator. So there's a, a human being speaking with the, the survey respondent and, uh, you know, helping with some of the interpretation, um, asking questions, rewording, making sure that understanding is really clear. And because this survey will be administered online or on paper, we don't have that luxury. And so trying to, you know, just develop the wording and the style of question that's able to capture the information that we want and need to develop reliable um, cost estimates was something we also put a lot of thought into. And hopefully that's reflected in the final uh, survey. So what are some of the anticipated research um, questions or uses that we'll be able to come out of this? So we hope to develop a um, summary report um, that goes, that describes the hemp, various hemp production practices and costs. So we'll be looking at those different production systems that I mentioned, but also different regions and different scales. Um, there's been a few mentions today of uh, market channel assessments. So we have a group, uh, you know, some folks who are part of the survey team also doing some interviews with um, hemp producers that are doing direct to consumer marketing, as well as other um, folks along the supply chain and trying to put some boots on the ground, understand some of the context, um, behind our marketing and processing questions and trying to understand what are the avenues to commercialization and how do those avenues actually influence the production practices and costs. So it's not, um, if you think of hemp as a specialty crop, it's not true that all low cost producers are the best producers. It's really going to take a skill set where you can combine, um, you know, managing production costs with the marketing component um, to really maximize your your net return. And so, how are how are folks managing those um, trade offs? Um, it, you know, within those direct to consumer marketing channels, um, we're thinking about staging and processing issues. So, hemp. You know, if you think about the hemp cultivation process, it's more than just putting the hemp in the ground in the spring and harvesting it in the fall. There's a lot of pre and post handling and further processing that goes on. So, to get develop really good cost of production estimates. We're also including those pre and post um, production handling and further processing steps and trying to put cost estimates on those. Um, and then a couple questions in the survey addressed issues like trust and um, credit. So the sources and uses of financing and credit, that's something that's not very well understood. 
currently in the industry, um, trust. So what information sources are uh, cultivators accessing and then which of those information sources are they really relying on to make decisions. Um, and so hopefully as this information comes out through the survey, we're able to contribute to the rulemaking and regulatory um, process. So what do I hope to achieve um, here as, as, a, as a group? Um, we really want to develop information to help uh, help the industry. So can we better understand the market structure um, of hemp, how markets you know behave and operate? Um, can we help avoid some of the mistakes of other bubbles? Um, and then can this information be used as, as baseline to guide um, investment production? decisions and I think you know how we know we'll be successful is if the information we produce can be uh, used to sustain some of the growth success and innovation within the industry so I thought I would go somewhat quickly um, through my slides so I hope that was informative I you know I really hope that uh, that was a, a useful preview so I think a lot of Folks who are on this call, you know, may be involved at some phase or some step of the um, survey process. There we go. I think I'm back. Um, and so, you know, we're so hopefully it's a good preview of that. And I'll, I guess I'll stop there. I wanted to leave time for questions. So, great. Thank you, Dan, very, very much. Um, we're going to open up to questions now, um, and I know that there's some things that have been lingering in the, the chat, but we'll open up for questions at this point for Dan, but for all of our uh, presenters. And then as you guys are thinking about that and, and maybe typing your, your question in the, the chat box, um, I'll just make a few general announcements. Um, first, there's been, there was some interest in access to the slides and we're going to do our best to try and retrieve um, sort of a list of participants so that if each presenter is willing, you know, they have to give their okay, then we can send the slides out to the whole group. The alternative to that is that Dan um, has very graciously offered to sort of coordinate and so it's going to share his email address and we would, and we would be able to actually email him uh, directly if you're interested in the slides. Thank you Suzanne and I just added my, my email to the uh, chat box. Oh, th and thank you. I'm still, am I still, is my screen still sharing? Yeah, it is. There it is. Yep. Perfect. And no. Um, Great. That might be. Dan, if you can put your mute button back on for the moment, I think we're generating some echo here. So let's see if, again, if there's no questions right away in the slides, I'll kind of go back to my list I was saving. Um, Gary, I know you had some, some uh, comments you were typing in very early during the first presentation about definition of a drug. And I wondered if you wanted to say anything or elaborate, or I know there was back and forth in the chat, but I want to give you a chance to, to elaborate. And feel free to turn your mic off and No, I just was, you know, when the comment was made that CBD is not a drug, it hit me interestingly because it certainly is a drug and regulated by the FDA and has impacts on how products are supposed to be marketed. And even though it doesn't seem to have much for teeth because we see products from all over the country in Maine being sold. And ideally, CBD products are not legal to be sold interstate. And it's just interesting to have a comment like that. And I think that 
you know, people that are doing surveys need to, to keep that in mind. I'm not sure when FDA will ever make a ruling, but hopefully fairly soon. That's it. Great, thank you. Yeah, there's a lot of moving parts that are happening right now. Um, I, you know, as I was listening to all the presenters and all the various projects and things that are going on, what the phrase that stuck in my mind is, it takes a village. <laughs> you know, we really are sort of seeing the, the, the rise of an industry and this industry grow. And um, there, there's so many pieces that have to come together. And, I, you know, I just want to say thank you to uh, not just the presenters, but everyone on this call who's working to make that happen. Um, another comment that was in earlier, I don't know if John is on John Strauss, but talked about micro dosing. And I don't know if you want to elaborate on that or um, if there was an actual question that went along or you just want to talk about it a little bit. Feel free to turn your, your mic on and speak up. Yeah, it wasn't really a question. I just, um, just something that uh, I've run into with whether talking to producers here in Colorado or people who use CBD that, you know, a product with 50 milligrams in it doesn't really seem to do much for people, you know, except it's more of a placebo effect. But, um, you know, that's just, that has just been my experience, which is anecdotal at best, so. Yeah, and John, I would add that, you know, for something I think about is the novelty of hemp. So both on the cultivation side, you know, hey, it's something that people want to trial, as, as Jane mentioned, let's try it out. You know, we never, we couldn't grow this before. Let's, you know, let's give it a shot. And on the consumption side, um, you know, the micro dosing aspect of, you know, is this something that, that we should just try, try out? Um, and so, you know, the micro dosing, you know, we can try a little bit at a time and, and test it out and see what we think, um, you know, Will that novelty wear off? I guess is, you know, something I've wondered about. Yeah, I would imagine that uh, if it doesn't do anything, you're not going to get a lot of repeat customers. Uh, it's a good point about the the novelty of it. Yeah, and that's that's definitely something we can look at because um, I haven't seen a whole lot on the micro dosing uh, front, uh, but with within some of our survey instruments, it might be interesting to to throw that in there as a possibility just to see if we can get a gauge for number of people that do that or if that's a, a kind of how they start and then they build up or or how that plays out. Yeah, I'd be interested to see. Great, thank you. Um, and then, let's see, I think I'll maybe take a little bit of moderator privilege here and, and ask a question or make a comment with a question uh, about some of the data issues. So, you know, data and data issues are sort of near and dear to my heart. And um, I wanted to mention one thing, because there's a lot of unexpected consequences or nuances to these. So, um, Dan talked about, showed us some great slides about comparison with FSA data on acreage and how these things, you know, where we get things from. But eventually, um, once all the states have moved over and are operating under the 2018 Farm Bill, that FSA number should look a lot closer, um, if not the same as the state data numbers because everyone will report through FSA once they're in that stage. But I, I see Jim has his, or James, I'm sorry, has his hand up. So I'm gonna let him ask his question. Go ahead, James. Thank you, thank you, Susan. Um, uh, I should be on, oh, sorry about the video. Um, I, I'll just ask him real quick. Uh, the folks who are doing the consumer studies, uh, I'm curious. I any chance, or is there, is it even on the risk of uh, feeder remediation? I know the standards are really, really good at uh, nasty stuff out of the soil, whether it's heavy metals or, or residual pesticides, herbicides, that kind of thing. So, I mean, is that is that something that's just so down in the weeds, figuratively, not literally, 
um, about you know about about a, a nuance of the of the product that the consumer just aren't aware of it. Your typical consumer is not going to know anything about the or is that something that you're trying to get a handle on? Because quite honestly, I think that's the real a real risk. I mean, low probability, high risk to the market. If someone suddenly gets lead poisoning because of their CBD treatment, that's the thing that grabs headlines and destroys markets. And I'm just wondering if that's been anything you guys have touched on, uh, in particularly in terms of consumer awareness. So I, um, Jim, I can take that one. And yes, that's something that uh, my small state is very interested in. And Heather Darby, who is a production expert and an early researcher into um, hemp production and, and has quite a large program right now, um, you know, she says that that in our state, the heavy metal issue isn't an issue at all. But I think that that could actually become a niche for producers and um, regional production, maybe even associating um, a, an origin um, label on hemp products or, 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 you know, organic production or so on. Because, you know, people ingest these products and heavy metals and those kinds of issues are are important so um so yes something we're very interested in um and something that i think i uh, heather would say is that a lot of people think that it's a no input crop and that it's just resilient and sustainable and um she'd be the first to say that no it isn't a no input um input crop and that there are ramifications but right now there aren't a whole lot of pesticides and herbicides being sprayed on hemp. But I hear you and I, I agree. But I think it could be an opportunity. So um, I'm afraid we're going to have to stop. So we've gotten a nod from AAEA that they're going to take our Zoom link away. They actually have another session scheduled right after us. Um, but this has been fantastic. I want to thank all of our speakers and all of our participants. I, I wish we had uh, a lot more time because I think there's a lot more discussion to be had. Um, maybe we'll um, talk afterwards, explore some options for uh, perhaps finding another venue to continue some of these conversations. Um, there will be a recording. I see this, Don just posted. There will be a recording of the session at the AAEA site in a week or two. Don't forget you have Dan's um, email if you would like copies of the slides and we will try to get those sent out to everybody. But we're gonna have to um, stop now before AAEA cuts us off completely. Thank you all so much. This has been a wonderful session. Let, let's give a, a round of applause, virtual applause to our, all of our speakers and hope to see you again soon. And the fantastic audience. Thank you.